Uh, I'm the chairman, I'm Der Montessori, and this session will be about bubbles and droplets. Uh, the first speaker is Lei Yang, uh, and he, he will, uh, she, sorry, she will uh, present a work, let me check this, okay, I present a work with the title Comparison of Capillary Bridge Models and Lattice Bolson Simulations by Lei Yang, Marcello Sega, and Jens Harting. Uh, so the stage is yours, Lei, and I think you can start. Thanks, Chairman, for the introduction. So, uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Lei Yang. So today I will give a talk on that is for many simulation of liquid bridges. Almost everybody has the experience of um, uh, building a sand castle when we have vacations or play with the kids. However, do we use a dry or wet sand? The, the answer is the uh, wet sand. Why? Yes, because uh, wet sand, uh, uh, in the wet sand, this capillary interaction exists, and uh, this interaction acts as, a, as an adhesion force, and then breathes, brings these sand uh, uh, particles together. And besides, in, in industry, uh, in the fertilization of biomass at high temperature, the fuels contains uh, ash, which has high amount of silica and the potassium, this silica and potassium are protein to melt at high temperature. Then this melting ash forms liquid bridge among the particles, and then finally it could form the agglomerates. The agglomerates in the system would finally change the hydrodynamics of the fluidite bed, such as the minimum fluidization velocity, the equivalent bubble, uh, sorry, bubble size, and also the equivalent particle diameter and also the particle concentration distribution. As, as a consequence, it would uh, um, cause the depolarization of the bed. Thus, it is necessary to study this capillary interaction. The aim of this project is to develop a fully resolved simulation of agglomeration in the fluid bed. We want to resolve the particle uh, motion by Newton's law and also we have to consider the capillary interaction at three phase counting line. Of course, the particle of fluid interaction is very important. And if we have high Reynolds number, the hydrodynamics is also very interesting. We used a numerical uh, solution by a coupled discrete element with the uh, lattice Bertman method. The lattice Bertman method is used to uh, solve the fluid field while the discrete element method is used to uh, is incorporated with capillary force is used to uh, resolve the particle uh, motion and finally we would like to simulate experimental agglomeration we have used a uh, district 19 mm, that's where my that's where it's mine with pgk clear model we are changing multi a component model is used. The particles are solved by Newton's equation. Sorry. Yeah, what is that? Because I hear nothing. I thought something happened. Sorry. Sorry for the. Uh, um, no, no. Okay. That's okay. Okay. Then uh, we, we first do some study of liquid bridge. Um, uh, between simulation and the theoretical, theoretical models. So how do we uh, uh, predict this capillary force in a simulation then? This is as follows. So we have placed two particles in, in the system and uh, we initialize a droplet in the particle. There's, between the, the particle, there's no external forces, forces exerted on the particle and the particles are fixed, the position and also the velocities. And then we let the system to equilibrate. And finally, after it reaches equilibrium, we measure the uh, force, which is the uh, capillary force. The simulation cities can be found uh, in the table. We have studied uh, a wide range of contact angle and also the uh, droplet to particle uh, volume uh, fraction rate. And here we have to make clear uh, some definitions, some variables which are very important for the capillary force, which is the contact angle theta, the uh, half filling angle, which is also called the embracing angle. 
and also the surface uh, particle surface to surf to surface separation distance, the inner and the outer uh, mean curvature of the bridge file. And then we make a comparison between the simulation and the theoretical uh, models. However, before, before the comparison, it is better to know how uh, capillary force is calculated from theory. Mainly, there are three approaches. The first uh, approach is based on the laplace yung equation uh, to solve the pressure difference. In this approach, the capillary force has two uh, contributions. One is the substation force, and the other is from the Laplace pressure. However, due to the fact that Laplace yung equation has no analytical solution for uh, the pressure difference in this case, the people always make uh, approximations uh, in order to predict the profile of the uh, bridge. There are um, uh, two approximations. One is, a, one is a toroidal approximation. It is used uh, when the monikers of the bridge is approximated by, by an arc. If the, the meridian radius, the outer uh, curvature of the bridge is orders of magnitude smaller than the particle radius, we use the uh, the Jevon approximation. The second approach is the energetic method, which is based on the derivation of the total interface energy. And uh, the third one is the curve fitting uh, to the numerical solution of laplace yung equation. So we have compared the lattice Boltzmann simulation with five different uh, theoretical models. They are coming from a um, toroidal approximation in which the capillary force have five different, uh, uh, depend on different uh, um, variables like the particle radius, the separation distance, the uh, substantial coefficient, the contact angle, uh, and also the half fitting angle. In uh, model C and also model E, they are curve fitting a uh, solution from the Laplace Yung equation. Uh, in model D, it is based on the energetic uh, method. In these three models, the capillary uh, force is a function of the bridge volume. And then we make comparisons between the simulation and uh, the theoretical models. So we fixed uh, the droplet volume. And then we change uh, uh, the uh, contact angle and also the separation distance between the particles. So at small, small contact angle, we found the, the uh, capillary force decrease with the increase in separation distance. As I mentioned before, the separate the uh, uh, surface tension, uh, the, so, sorry, the capillary force has two uh, components. One is from the uh, substantial force and the other is from the uh, uh, is from the uh, Laplace pressure. In these cases, the uh, substantial force is dominant while, and uh, the substantial force is decreasing with increasing uh, separation distance. While at higher uh, contact angle, we observed uh, uh, not so much uh, difference, difference when the uh, separation distance increases. And uh, somehow we observed a little peak in the center. This is uh, um, because the fact that we observed from our LBM simulation, we found that the transition of the bridge file from the king convex uh, to a concave um, uh, shape. And uh, the uh, capillary force is a compromise of the uh, effect of the self-extension force and uh, the Laplace force. In comparison with all the five models, we found uh, the LBM simulation obtains a good agreement with models from ABC. ABC in all the cases, while uh, model D or predicts or predicts the uh, capillary force at small uh, separation distance, while it under predicts the capillary force at larger separation distance, while in other cases, the, cap the capillary force is over predicted by model E. And then we fixed uh, the contact angle and then we uh, change 
the uh, uh, job is volume. For small li li liquid volume, we also observed um, uh, the similar trend of capillary force uh, over the separation distance. And uh, at higher, as before, and at, at higher uh, liquid volume, we found uh, also um, um, almost uh, a constant uh, uh, capillary force. And in this um, case, we also observed that there's a transition of the bridge file from King Rex to uh, King Cave. And in comparison with all the theoretical models, we found uh, also in this case, uh, model A and model B has better agreement uh, uh, with the simulation results, while uh, model D and model E, the uh, agreement uh, needs some improve, Im improvement, while model D, it, the, the accuracy, um, um, in the accuracy uh, decreases at higher uh, bridge volume. Five minutes. Yeah, then we make a, a comparison we can include here. So the uh, toroidal approximations has better agreement uh, with uh, experiment simulation, but uh, since it has to uh, get calculate the half mini angle, it is not easy to implement in the discrete element method. And uh, the accuracy of model E and model D and needs improvement. Finally, we choose this model uh, C from Willard to um, uh, to implement into the DM code. However, from uh, our simulations, when the convex angle is larger than 90, we found a asymm symmetric bridge among the particles. They saw the liquid is pushed away from the center to minimize surface energy in order to get a stable bridge. How in this case, all the theoretical models fails because this, the theoretical models can only be used to uh, uh, all the symmetric bridges. And the toroidal approximation gives uh, 10 to 30% errors for large uh, bridge volume and uh, large separation distance. While for the poly dispersed uh, spheres, there's a limited um, uh, study in the literature. Thus, um, the numerical, numerical tool to study the liquid uh, bridge is um, uh, uh, important. And then we also do some more. So we study the liquid bridge among more particles. So the first is uh, uh, three particles. We found that since the distance, separation distance between the bottom two particles and the top ones are different. So the liquid is just uh, uh, pushed down and formed a, a nice bridge between these two bottom two particles. Since we have uh, four uh, particles on the right movie and it is uh, uh, symmetrically distributed, so we find we finally observe a uh, very nice um, uh, uh, liquid bridge among all these four particles. Then we study the effect of capillary force. As I mentioned before, we employ the capillary force model from Minert, and then we add this force to the uh, linear motion of the particle. Since the capillary force is exerted on the center line of the particles, so its uh, contribution to the angular motion is zero till now. And then we switch to a uh, big system. So we have uh, 634 particles and uh, uh, we initialize it, it, ram it is randomly distributed in the system and we have a periodic boundary and the shear flow is um, imposed and uh, we found uh, if there is no capillary force so the particles are uniformly distributed in the system however if we have the capillary force we found cluster is um, is uh, is formed with larger substantial coefficient which means we have larger uh, uh, capillary force bigger cluster is uh, observed this brings the end to uh, my talk. So in this uh, work, we uh, we use the light force man with Shen Chen model to predict the liquid bridge uh, between um, particles. And uh, we uh, implement the capillary model from Willard into the DM simulations. And uh, do, uh, when we simulate um, the uh, big system, we observe the particle clustering and due to the capillary force. 
for the future, it is, uh, it is uh, interesting to study the Capri bridge uh, uh, between the cylinders because the industry always say uh, particles are not uh, spherical, they can be other uh, shape. Besides, uh, for the particle clustering, it is um, interesting to make quantifications uh, of the particle clustering. Uh, yeah, uh, this spring, uh, yeah, thank you for, for your attention. So, thank you so much for this very interesting presentation. So, uh, I think we have time for only one very quick question. So, if someone wants to, to make a question to Lei, if not, okay, if not, uh, thanks again, Lei. Uh, and I think we can uh, skip to the next speaker, uh, which is Dr. Medvedev, uh, which will present. Uh, and a presentation you. about your wealth. Okay, uh, now the next speaker is Dr. Medvedev. Uh, we'll have a talk about bubbles and droplets in electric field uh, mesoscopic simulation. So, uh, yes, I can see you, Dimitri. Uh, so, uh, whenever you want, the stage is yours. Uh, okay, good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Is my presentation visible? Yes, I can see it. Okay, then I can start. I am Dmitry Medvedev from uh, Lavrentiev Institute of Hydrodynamics from Novosibirsk, Russia. And I would like to speak about uh, behavioral bubbles and droplets in electric field. Our simulation on this topic. Uh, short motivation of this topic, you probably know that uh, in many types of high voltage equipment, uh, liquid insulation is used. And uh, any liquid contains bubbles of vapor or of different gases. And since the electric strength of gas is much lower than that, than that of liquid, this bubble can serve as a start for electric discharges, which in bad case will lead to breakdown. So we, uh, there is a need to investigate the behavior of bubbles in order to avoid such a disaster. And also we can use electric field to guide to drive electric uh, drive droplets or films to some desirable behavior for example we can design some more efficient uh, cooling systems for example in this case we deal with uh, multi-phase media and uh, now it is a method of choice is mesoscopic methods, such as lattice Boltzmann method. So just a short um, sketch how droplets and bubbles behave in electric field. Probably everybody knows that in uniform electric field directed vertically on this sketch, the droplet elongates along the field. It is less clear for the case of a bubble in liquid under the action of electric field. I saw many simulations where bubble elongates perpendicular to the field, but it is not correct since in this case, uh, people do not uh, take into account electrostriction. So the correct behavior is also the elongation along the field. But what happens if the field uh, becomes non-uniform? For example, if you have two small electrodes, then the field in the center will be higher and uh, at sides, the field will be lower. And uh, how will the bubble behave? So uh, now for the methods, we use Lattice-Boltzmann method in 2D and 3D cases, 
usual models D2 Q9 and D3 Q19. To simulate the multi-phase fluid, we apply Van der Waals equation of state, which in reduced variables is written here. And to simulate this case, we use the pseudo-potential method when there is a force equal to minus gradient of pseudo-potential, and the pseudo-potential is expressed through the equation of state with this term. And in this case, there is an adjustment coefficient which uh, <coughs> matches uh, physical units and lattice units. And usually it, it coefficient is uh, rather small. And uh, here is the expression of the force with this uh, constant A, we can adjust our scheme in order to get the best agreement with the theoretical coexistence curve. For the implementation of forces, we use the exact difference method proposed by Cooper Stoch. And uh, in the case of forces, the physical velocity is the velocity, the average between the velocity before and after the action of force. Also, we simulate the transfer of heat in our model. We use the model with constant specific heat. So there is advection of internal energy and the sources. This is pressure work, this is heat conduction, viscous heating, and other sources of heating. We simulate the pressure work by finding differences. Viscous heating is usually neglected because it is small. And the, to solve the advection equation for the internal energy in multi-phase case, we use a passive scalar method. We introduce second set of distribution functions with a like lattice Boltzmann-like equation of state. And not equation of state, evolution equation, of course. And in this case, the problem is a spurious diffusion at the interfaces and to <laughs> Avoid it, we introduce special pseudo forces which keep the internal energy inside the phases. So the temperature is constant in the case without heat sources. And the electric field causes the Helmholtz force, which was already introduced at the plenary lecture. It is the force due to um, non-uniform medium, non-uniform fluid, and the electrostriction force. In our case, we simulate insulating medium, so there is no charge density. And we use some clauses Masotti density dependence of permittivity. We solve the Poisson's equation for the electric potential calculates the electric field and calculates the electric forces. And uh, some non-dimensional parameter to describe our situation is the electrical capillary number or electrical bond number, which is the ratio between electric forces and uh, surface tension forces. Well, some example of the behavior of a bubble in uniform electric field, bubble elongates along the few lines and uh, acquires the shape of ellipsoid. And we can <coughs> characterize the shape by this non-dimensional deformation. And there are graphs for time evolution of deformation for three different capillary numbers. We compare this uh, with experimental results, and uh, there is a quite a good agreement of the degree of deformation. In non-uniform field, some interesting, more interesting 
phenomena occurs. Here is the simulation of a bubble between two quite lone electrons. In this case, the evolution does not differ essentially from the case of the uniform field. Bubble elongates along the field. But for shorter electrodes, the forces due to non-uniformity came into play, and uh, the final shape is almost round. And uh, if electrodes are even shorter, then bubble elongates perpendicular to the field. And uh, since this uh, position is not <coughs> Not steady, the bubble escapes from the position between electrons. Here you can see the movie, how this process develops. So bubble elongates and finally escapes from between electrons. If we have two pairs of electrons with opposite polarity, then the field is low in the center. And there is a kind of quadrupole trap. So the bubble is trapped in this position and it elongates slightly. You can see this also in this movie. Now let's go to the droplets. In this case, we have a droplet between two parallel electrodes. And this is the case when the field is more or less uniform. You can see that the drop elongates as it is well known. What happens if we have an insulating part of low electrodes? It is shown by this uh, blue, so blue circle. So the field is non-uniform in this case. And you can see that Opposite to the previous case, the drop, droplet flattens. It is pulled into the region of high magnitude of electric field as the perimeter five, of this. Five minutes, sorry, five minutes. Okay, okay. For higher electric field, more interesting effect occurs. The droplet flattens and it is broken and um, acquires an uh, annular shape. And some interesting occurs at the edge of the droplet. You can see this protrusions. It is a manifestation of instability under the action of electric field, instability of the surface of liquid dielectrics. And uh, the last example is um, a liquid film which is put between two electrodes and in low electrodes there are four insulating circles. So you can see that the liquid is pulled in the region between the <coughs> these circles. The film perforates and um, acquires some more or less curved shape. If we switch off the field, the film will return to its um, flat initial shape. So let me make the conclusions. We apply the mesoscopic lattice Boltzmann model to simulate bubbles and droplets in the electric field. In uniform field, bubbles and droplets elongate along the field. And in non-uniform field, bubbles and droplets usually flattens. So elongate along the uh, stretch across the field. And we can trap a bubble in the kind of quadrupole trap. And we may manipulate droplets with um, electric field if you have some interesting shape of the electrodes.
and we also can observe the controlled perforation of a liquid film. This can be, in principle, used in some cooling devices because these contact lines are usually very efficient to evaporation, so they are efficient for cooling. Thank you for your attention, and I need to acknowledge the financial support by Russian Science Foundation. Now I am ready for a question. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Dimitri, for your very interesting and intriguing presentation. I think we have uh, a couple of minutes for question time, so please, if someone want to ask something to Dimitri, yes, Ilya. Uh, so, <laughs> you are very nice talk. Thank you. I have just one question about the basic uh, basics of the model. So. As far as I understand, you use the Van der Waals equation of state, right? Yes. And however, I've noticed that the energy of the medium is assumed to be ideal gas. Uh, excuse me. Can you comment on that? Could you repeat, please? So the energy, your energy is of ideal gas. Uh, no. Uh, it, it is known that uh, if you have an no, equation wait of... Wait a minute. Is it like that or is it not? I mean, I, I just seen on one slide, some slides before that, the energy is the function of temperature. You mean this one, yes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So... Uh, it is known that um, if your equation of state is linear, in the temperature so I, I i i read it correctly it's energy of ideal gas yes okay you can you can say so but it is equally right for the van der waals because for the van der waals equation of state the specific heat does not depend on density really okay it is it is true for all equation of state, which are linear in temperature. Really? Okay. Didn't know that. Thank you very much. Okay. I think we are short of time. So, uh, thanks again, Dimitri. And, uh, okay, I think now we have a coffee break. So, we will be here in 20 minutes, uh, 11 and 20, for the next uh part and the title are reversed <laughs> okay. i guess perfect <laughs> oh, okay okay i will read from yours okay so i think we can start uh, the second part of this uh, of this technical session uh, about bubbles and droplets um it's the turn of uh, alberto giacomello and which the, the title of the presentation is as a re air event simulations of drying in nano confinement Super hydrophobicity, nanobubbles, and nanopores. So uh, the stage is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction and for giving me this opportunity to talk about simulation of drying in nano confinement. So the subtitle mentioned actually three different um, cases super hydrophobicity, nanobubbles, and nanopores. But given the time constraint, I, I would prefer to focus only on nanopores in order to tell a complete story. So, what is uh, what kind of drying am I talking about? So uh, it's a real uh, phase transition, so uh, uh, induced by confinement. So um, the fact that you have extreme confinement can uh, give rise to uh, the formation of vapor at uh, thermodynamic condition where you wouldn't expect the vapor to be. For instance, uh, you uh, can achieve um, boiling of water at pressures as high as tens of megapascal at ambient temperature. This can be induced by nanoconfinement combined with surface hydrophobicity. So why is it relevant? Well, it's relevant for a number of technological reasons. For instance, uh, you see uh, on the upper left an example of super hydrophobic surfaces, which are nanostructure in order to improve the stability of the super hydrophobic state 
Uh, we're also very interested in application involving nanoporous materials in which the phase behavior of water or other liquids within these nanopores determine uh, the application of such nanopores as energy storage or energy damping devices. And finally, there's a number of other technological applications, for instance, in uh, small scale reverse osmosis membranes. So here you see uh, single file motion of water within these nanotubes. But also we are very interested in biological, in the biological relevance of these uh, phase transition in extreme confinement. Here you see an ion channel, which is a, a sort of switch uh, of uh, our cells uh, in which uh, a nanobubble is formed, which is able to uh, block uh, the ionic current, which is uh, how the information is um, transmitted throughout our body. So, however, today I will focus on the um, uh, basic physics of it. And so I will study all these nano-confined environments uh, with a simple one, which is a cylindrical pore immersed in water. Uh, what is the computational challenge of, uh, uh, of this kind of simulations? Uh, which, by the way, are particle-based simulation. You see, uh, I will mainly present today molecular dynamic simulations. Um, uh, so, since this is a, a phase transition, uh, even if confined, uh, there is typically a free energy barrier connected to uh, the phase change. And these free energy barriers brings along a long time scale, which scales exponentially with the free energy barrier in uh, units of, K, uh, of uh, energy. So KBT. So this poses a challenge for, for us computational scientists because there is a multiplicity of time scale ranging from the microscopic dynamics, which is fast. In our case, it's uh, uh, thermal agitation of the molecules and a long time scale, which is dictated by the free energy barriers of the system. Um, this is also a problem uh, in experiments, by the way. And then there is a problem with uh, the multiple length scale present in the system because all the properties I will talk about today uh, have a nanoscale origin, but they have macroscopic consequences. Uh, so uh, the range of length scales spans from the nanoscale to much larger scales. So the approach we usually take is to combine uh, different hierarchically, uh, different levels of description of the system, ranging from molecular simulation, which resolve with minimal uh, requirement of modeling uh, into facial and face properties of, for instance, water, and continuum models uh, informed by the uh, molecular simulations, which allow us to access larger scales. We tackle the multiplicity of time scales with a class of uh, simulation techniques which are called rare event techniques which allow to smartly sample phase space in order uh, to uh, visit also those regions of the phase space where it is most improbable to go but are crucial for the transition. So here you see that we are able to reconstruct the free energy and thus access uh, by this formula the, the, the long time scale of um, of uh, the transition itself. Uh, we have elaborated also analogous methods for continuum models. So uh, today I will talk about how drying of a cylindrical nanopore in a hydrophobic cavity uh, uh, proceeds in the presence of a gas molecule, to, to put a little bit of spice in it. So uh, why do we have to care about the system at all? Uh, the first reason is that uh, so our cells our, uh, uh, have switches which are able to switch information which is carried by ionic currents on and off. And these switches, many of those switches, not all of them, some of them um, are known to work by uh, the formation of nanoscale bubbles which are able to, uh, to switch on and off these ionic currents. So this is how basically our brain works, so how neurons fire and how our muscle contract. And why gases? Well, gases play uh, indeed 
uh, are supposed, so, so far is an hypothesis, to play an important role in the is hydrophobic gating mechanism because they are able to favor uh, the formation of nanobubbles and thus uh, achieve an aesthetic action okay so uh, the basic mechanism is without gases what diluted gases but uh, we're studying today in the presence of gases to see whether uh, this hypothesis of um, mm, anest uh, general anesthetics works or not the second motivation we have is a more engineering like one and regards this class of nanoporous materials, which are hydrophobic. These materials show rather interesting properties, both from a fundamental point of view and from an application point of view, uh, because they are made, uh, they come as grains of sand, and each uh, grain of this sand have billions of pores. Some of these materials have rather monodispersed pores, such that with a microscopic measurement, you see here, it's a standard hydraulic press, which uh, measures microscopic volume, but here you have mil billions of pores immersed in water. Uh, you transform a nanoscale uh, phenomenon into a microscopic measurement, and the measurement goes as follows. You start uh, with the interior of these porous materials in the dry state you increase the pressure and you achieve uh, and nothing really happens until you achieve intrusion which means that the pores become wet uh, this is this plateau then you keep increasing and nothing much happens because you have a rather in incompressible uh, liquid but you can decrease the pressure and you see that the drying process occurs at a different pressure however this pressure is remarkably high and it's of the order of some tens of megapascal, rather uh, surprisingly, because of course this is a boiling, uh, uh, this is confined boiling, if you wish. The difference between the intrusion pressure and the extrusion pressure define a hysteresis cycle. So the, the system pictured here would behave as an energy dissipator, for instance, uh, capable of dissipating uh, a mechanical vibration. However, if you're able to design your system such that intrusion and extrusion pressure are closer together, you can think of storing energy in the form of surface energy with this kind of device. And indeed, you see a rather, an early uh, patent for this kind of system. Uh, introduction of gas inside of this system may be uh, an important uh, way to control the phase behavior of water inside uh, these nanopores. So the system we simulate is a cylindrical nanopore with a single particle. Uh, rather technical detail is SPCE water. Uh, there is one argon atom and we will use later on two restrain variables. So we will be able to restrain the position of the gas molecules um, along the pore axis and the number of water molecules inside of this cylindrical pore. So first of all we started out so the colors are inverted but still you see in blue the gas particle with an unrestrained simulation. This unrestrained simulation tells us something already very important which is that the gas particle is attracted inside of the pore and you see it induces uh, some bubbles which are tiny uh, and uh, get reabsorbed until a sufficiently large fluctuation is obtained which achieves complete drying of uh, the nanopore. And then gas stays within the pore. So let's try to quantify it a little bit better. So this is the pore radius and you see that the probability um, of finding a gas particle is maximum at uh, the pore wall. So uh, basically this hydrophobic atom, this hydrophobic gas resides preferentially at the wall. If you give a look to the density in the absence or in the presence of this gas particle, you see that indeed um, the presence of a gas particle reduces the density at the wall. Uh, more importantly, on the right, uh, you have fluctuation of water density in, inside of the pore with and without the gas particle. 
And you see that in red is without the particle and in black is with the particle. Very importantly, um, uh, the tail at low water occupancies uh, is magnified, which means that um, low density water fluctuation are enhanced, or if you wish, uh, uh, tentative bubbles, uh, you have fluctuation uh, with small bubbles forming, okay? You have four minutes. Okay, so we further quantify this in terms of free energy. So we computed uh, with uh, the free energy uh, of this system as a function of the number of particles and uh, the um, coordinate of the gas molecule. So here, the white line means that's um, outside of the pore. Here is the inside of the pore. And you see two valleys corresponding to the field state, so to the wet state and to the dry state. And we ask ourselves, how do we go from A to D? So from the, field, uh, from the wet pore without a gas to the empty pore with the gas. And uh, we see that there are two main paths for going. Uh, and these paths are the black one, in which uh, first the gas enters into the pore and then the pore de-wets, and the second one, which uh, follows the opposite path. So the pore de-wets and then the gas enters. Both of these paths are uh, possible. So you can make your bets on which one is the most energetically favorable one, and in the next slide you will discover whether you have won or not. So. Uh, the answer is that the black path is the most favorable one. Indeed, the fact that the gas enters the wet pore and induces this uh, fluctuation in the density completely obliterates the drying barrier. So you see that along the red path, uh, you have a free energy barrier connected with the formation of the initial bubble. So you have to pay an energetic price in order to form the initial bubble which the presence of gas uh, completely uh, obliterates. Here you have the formation of vapor bubble, and then without a barrier you have entering of uh, the pore. So summarizing, the gas is attracted inside of the wet pore, bubbles forms at the wall without barrier, and the bubble stabilizes gas as compared to the vapor bubble without gas. So this is, uh, is the effect of pore hydrophobicity, which I will skip. And I'll jump to the conclusions. So hydrophobic gases favor drying, accelerating bubble formation and stabilizing the gated state. So the state in which you have a nanoscale bubble which blocks ionic currents. This may play an important role in general anesthetic action. So in opening ion channels when the patient is administered with uh, a dose of hydrophobic gas. In a technological context, these uh, may lead to a decreased intrusion and extrusion hysteresis, which is um, helpful in designing such heterogeneous uh, systems. So this is part of a larger work in which uh, we explore routes to control drying uh, via nanoconfinement. And we have explored uh, the use of different geometries and different hydrophobicity of the surface, we have uh, seen that nanoscale effects, for instance, line tension, help in favoring drying. And in this talk, I've explored the role of hydrophobic gases. If you're interested in more details concerning the first two points, I uh, have added here two reference, two recent references to uh, the other works which I uh, men mentioned in the title. With that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thanks. Uh, thank um, sources of funding and of computational resources and my recently uh, formed group in Rome, which uh, did most of the work. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Alberto, for this overly interesting presentation. I think we have um, some minutes for the questions. So, uh, please, if you have any question, speak now. Yes, Alberto, this is Mauro Sbragaglia. Uh, so uh, I have a question uh, slash curiosity. So um, in the introduction uh, uh, to the problem, you mentioned uh, a free energy barrier, and I see you write surface tensions, uh, and I think that uh, in the old theoretical framework, uh, those surface tensions are just numbers. I was wondering uh, 
if uh, uh, at those uh, nanoscales uh, curvature corrections matter. So Tolman length uh, or related stories uh, in this uh, pore nucleation. Do you know anything about that? Yes, uh, certainly um, we have extensively compared um, uh, na uh, molecular level simulation with continuum models. And in order to do that, you always have to do some parameter matching, which uh, needs to be done very carefully. Mm -hmm. So it is known that um, curvature effects may play a role. Um, and uh, this has been measured in experiments in uh, nucleation, so cavitation. Exactly, uh, cavitation, but I mean, it is also, but in, in some sense, uh, your, yes, it's homogeneous, but in some sense, uh, your experiment uh, is, uh, let's say, a cavitation inside the pore, if you want to say. Definitely, definitely. Okay. Uh, so, uh, we're currently working on line tension. Line uh, tension. The main problem is that all these effects uh, um, act together at the same scale. So you have curvature correction, you have line tension, and it's very difficult in a heterogeneous environment to disentangle all of them. So you need uh, a continuum theory in order to be able to disentangle them. And uh, we're currently working on trying to identify the line tension. So uh, in this geometry, it is possible to identify the line tension, not, not curvature corrections. I see, I see. Uh, but uh, you say it's possible they are there. It's possible they Definitely. Are. No, no, we measure the, the fact that they indeed help uh, in mm -hmm. uh, figuring drying. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Thank okay, uh, other questions? Can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Hi, Alberto, this is Halim. Halim. Yeah, so uh, I think it's probably continuing to what Mauro was asking. So I think you highlight the potential importance of line tension and uh, Tolman length and so forth. But I'm also wondering, um, in a sense, if you think about the equation of state for the uh, liquid and the gas, they may actually change because of confinement. So is that something that you also have to revise in a sense when you actually work out your continuum uh, theory or you can actually take the equation of state that you might have got in the bulk and then just plug in there or you have to do corrections? So. Uh, well, first of all, in molecular dynamics, we are lucky enough that everything is encompassed automatically. Uh, so, um, there are uh, continuum theories on how the coexistence between liquid and vapor change based on um, based uh, on the confining environment. And uh, so, for instance, the Kelvin-Laplace equation, the Kelvin equation for uh, cylindrical capillaries, and we have extended this for uh, different geometries. So indeed, uh, there is some theories. Uh, most of them uh, deal with microscopic capillarity, so they don't have, uh, um, they don't come with uh, um, the extension to Tolman length and uh, these kind of things. But this can be done and worked out. Uh, what is important is always to have both approaches, so the microscopic one and uh, the continuum one, uh, because one, so to say, represents uh, everything of uh, the phase behavior of water in confinement, and the other one allows you to interpret uh, what you're seeing uh, and not just give numbers. So indeed, uh, th there are, um, it is not uh, the equation of state, but uh, the um, coexistence between liquid and vapor, confined liquid and vapor, does change, and you have uh, an expression for that. I see. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So I think we can move on to the following presenter, that is Adriano Tribocchi. Adriano, are you here? Yes. Yes, I'm here. Can you hear okay, me? Okay. Perfect. Yeah, I can hear you, but I cannot see your screen shared. Very good. Yeah. One second. So, sorry, yeah, yeah, Andrea, yeah. is it not me? Um, yeah, it's uh, me. Oh, sorry, sorry. Oh. Sorry, I, uh, I mean, I uh, no, no. To, to okay, I my fault. Sorry, it's okay. It's okay. First, uh, Halim Kuzumatma, and then Adriano Tribaki. So, sorry, that was my fault. So, uh, <laughs> Halim, uh, you, if you want, you can, you can That's share. That's okay. <laughs> I, was just, uh, no, I'm not sure. yeah. I don't know why I, I, I read the third line, not the second, but uh, okay. Anyway. Hi. Sure. Share your screen with everyone. So is it sharing now? Can you see my uh, screen? I cannot, no, actually, me, no. I Okay, now it is loading. Yeah. Okay, yeah. it's quite slow. Yes, because I can see myself in your screen. Okay. Can you see my slide? Uh, yes, now, perfect. So I can present you. So the next speaker, 
is uh, Alin Kusumatmaya, and his presentation will be, about, will be about the modeling drops on liquid infused surfaces using ternary free energy lattice Bolson method. So please, Alin, begin whenever you want. Yeah, great. So uh, first of all, thank you for the organizer for giving the opportunity uh, to present today. So uh, what I would like to do today is to show you uh, some of the uh, work that we recently uh, have done um, on liquid infused surfaces. Um, so maybe a good starting point is to tell you what liquid infused surfaces are, because probably most of you are not familiar with it. So liquid infused surfaces are, in a sense, a novel class of functional materials uh, which are inspired by uh, this uh, pitcher plant. So this is something that you might have seen in your botanical garden. So I'm going to show you two movies now, uh, one when the environment is dry and one when the environment is wet. So let me play the movies. So when it's dry, for example, um, you know, you can have ants which are actually just happily walking around the surface of the plant. But then when it's actually wet, <clears throat> you see that the surface uh, becomes very slippery. So this is very bad for the end, but it's very good for the plant because it's a carnivorous plant. So uh, inspired by this to actually create surfaces which are very slippery, uh, people have, of course, uh, tried to exploit this for uh, applications in industry and in engineering. So uh, one of the, I think, uh, common examples that you have seen if you Google liquid infused surfaces is for this uh, a coating of uh, liquid packaging. So this is uh, what you might have experienced yourself uh, with your uh, ketchup bottle. But if you change, let's say, the coating of your surface, then you have a surface which is very slippery. And then this is actually good for many reasons. So for example, you can minimize uh, waste and so forth. So um, for the context of what I'm going to show you today, uh, you should be thinking about a surface which is either rough porous or basically, uh, you know, very complex. But then there is a, a, a liquid which is imbibing the corrugation. So this is typically an oil or a lubricant. And then the uh, fluid of interest is actually what I call water droplet here. So this is actually sitting on top of this composite surface, which is made out of some solid surface and the oil or the lubricant. OK, so uh, we've done uh, many things on this uh, on this problem. But uh, the topic I want to discuss today is what happens if the surface texture uh, underlying this liquid infused surface has a gradient to it. So what you uh, should see in my slide is that you have a solid fraction, which is quite small on the left, and then a solid fraction, uh, which are quite large on the right. So the question is, uh, does it move? Uh, where does it move? Uh, and you know what kind of pattern is, uh, is the best uh, to actually create motion? So of course, the uh, problem of uh, you know, motion due to uh, uh, texture gradient or wetting gradient uh, is not uh, completely new. Uh, so here I'm just going to show you uh, three examples that are in a sense quite uh, well known, quite popular in the literature. So the first one probably comes all the way to uh, about, you know, almost 30 years ago now. So this is from uh, the group of George Whitesides, um, where he actually uh, introduced chemical gradient on the surface. So you have uh, a gradient in the contact angle. Uh, so the pictures uh, that you have seen here is that the droplet can actually move against gravity uh, going from the hydrophobic region to the hydrophilic region. Uh, David Kere's group uh, in France uh, has also thought about uh, inducing droplet motion uh, using superhydrophobic surfaces. And then again, he's playing with the surface texture. So in a sense, it's similar to what I'm talking about today, except uh, they don't have any uh, lubricant imbibing the corrugation. And you can actually induce motion. And then to help uh, motion, uh, what they do is that they actually vibrate it uh, to uh, kill the contact angle hysteresis. Uh, and the last example I would like to show you is again from uh, the group of David Kere. So what they have done uh, in this context is that they introduce a ratchet surface that you can see uh, on my screen. Uh, and then they actually heat the surface uh, so that it's uh, basically boiling the droplet. So this is called light and frost drop. There is a, a layer of air between the droplet and the surface. And then if you let the system go, it's actually uh, moving, right? Um, and it's moving to a particular direction because the surface has a ratchet to it. So the point I would like to emphasize at this stage is that in all the cases that people have seen, whenever you introduce some sort of gradient to the surface, uh, whatever droplet that you put, if you keep the same surface, it always moves in one specific direction, okay? so. 
it always moves in one particular direction, either to the more uh, hydrophilic region or to the region where the uh, surface uh, has a larger solid fraction. So the question that we were uh, asking is that what happens if we do the same experiment, if you like, on liquid infused surfaces? Okay, so the question is, does it also tell the same story that it moves to the same direction all the time? Uh, but surprisingly, the answer is, is no. Uh, and this is probably the simplest analytical model that you can come up with. So uh, one thing to uh, remember when you're considering this liquid into your surface is that uh, the physics at the contact line is very complex. So if I zoom in uh, into the foot of the droplet, this is typically the sketch that you will draw. So you actually have three contact lines, uh, one between the water, oil, and air, and the second one between the, uh, the water, the effective substrate, and the oil. And then the third one is between the air, the oil, and the effect effective substrate. So if we now take a look at uh, what is the uh, forces that are acting on the uh, basically the, the different contact lines, uh, I can actually write a, a simple equation for this. So let me concentrate on, let's say, the uh, what I call the inner meniscus. And then I'm going to concentrate on uh, this guy here that I box in blue. So you see that there will be uh, capillary forces related to surface tension due to the interaction between the oil and the effective substrate, which is made out of part solid, part oil. So this is basically uh, part solid uh, oil, and this is oil oil. Of course, this is zero. And then for simplicity, I'm just going to average this based on the solid fraction. I can do the same thing uh, for the force over here, which is due to with uh, the interaction between the water and the effective substrate. So you see the interaction or the surface tension between solid water uh, weighted uh, by the solid fraction and then the oil water. I can also do the same thing for the outer meniscus. And then if you then go through with the math and then do the um, algebra carefully, what is interesting is that um, you end up with the expression over here uh, at the bottom left. And this has a very simple uh, physical interpretation. So all the complication due to the surface corrugation is actually... Uh, Oh, I just got a message saying that the screen is frozen. Can you not see my screen? Sorry, actually, no. Um, ah, okay. Uh, sorry, I didn't realize it. Uh, yeah, I, I thought it, it was a problem of mine because I have a terrible connection, but... Let me try again. Uh, mm. I'm really sorry, I didn't realize it. So I only realize it when people tell me uh, through a different uh, message. Can you see my screen now? No, uh, actually, no. Okay, now, uh, now you're sharing your screen, yeah. Wait a second, because it's loading. But can know. you see what I'm showing? No, I, no, actually, I'm. Uh, it's it's kind of frozen. I don't know. So if I disable cam, does it actually help? Yeah, perhaps is better just to save some bandwidth. But no, okay, I, can you, I, I don't, can you I don't know the... Screen? No. No? No, I don't know the other, but... Oh, me neither, me neither. Okay. You're not seeing anything either. Oh, okay. I'm really sorry, I didn't realize it. Mm -hmm. Maybe I, I, I go off and then go back in. Yeah, let's try with it. And Can now I, mm, not now. Okay, now it's loading. Okay, okay, now I can see your screen.
Okay, can you see uh, the different slide? Does it actually move? No, actually, everything is like freezed. I don't know. Oh. Hmm. Mm. Um. Let's try again, just to... Try to deactivate your uh, webcam, just, I mean. Okay, I'm deactivating my webcam. Okay, now I can see your screen. Okay, so does it actually work if I do this? Okay, and now I can see also your slide that are, uh, I mean, are moving, but. So if I do this, does it actually move? <laughs> Perhaps the, there is some very big lag. Anyway, now I see the full screen presentation. I don't know the other, uh, the audience, uh, but I can see the presentation. That is a slide which is simple analytical model, right? Yeah. Okay. Yes. So let's let's try okay. to. Please tell me if uh, it continue. doesn't work, yeah. and then uh, we'll figure it out. Okay. Yeah. So I'm really sorry about this. So um, mm. I guess to cut the story short, um, we're looking at droplet uh, on this liquid in few surfaces, uh, and there is a gradient to it. And then when we actually look at the force balance, uh, we end up with um, with a force uh, that actually is at the bottom left. And what is interesting here is that the um, all the complication due to the uh, surface corrugation is actually captured in this integral. Uh, but there is actually a prefactor uh, that you can think about as the um, uh, the wetting preference between the water droplet and the solid surface, and then the water droplet related to the uh, lubricant, okay? Uh, so this is the prediction, and therefore, uh, depending on the uh, balance of the surface tension, you can actually have bidirectional motion. Either you move to the case where the droplet is moving to the denser solid area, or it's going to move to the sparser solid area. Okay, so this is the uh, analytical model, and what I'm going to tell you now is uh, some uh, modeling that we have done to uh, demonstrate this. Uh, we also have some experimental data to, uh, to, to back it up. And then to, uh, to model it, uh, we are using a uh, free energy uh, model. Can you see my slide? Hello? Yeah. Can you see my slide? Hey, Alim. OK, great. So it seems to be working now. So uh, the model that we use is a free energy model. Uh, and because we have uh, three fluid systems, so a ternary system, um, I introduce uh, these three terms which are related to the double well potential. So uh, you can see that uh, because of the double well potential, the minima for each term correspond to C equals to zero and C equals to one. So this so, is related. Sorry, guys. So, sorry, Ali. Uh, I, I see the previous slide, perhaps the simple analytical model. I don't know the audience. If, if it is a problem of mine, that's right. But I don't know if. Um, yeah, I think the slide is not moving. Okay. The slide is not moving. OK. Uh, I, I can't see it either. It's not moving. OK, I'm not sure what happened. So I think maybe if I don't actually. Uh, maybe it's actually confused. Uh, so if I do this, do you see my screen? Let's try to. Um, I don't know. What, what because is, uh, because now now the, the next speaker and then Alim. Uh, uh, yeah, perhaps it's, it's better. Then we can postpone Alim after Adriano, perhaps. Okay, maybe. So I'm really sorry, everyone. No, no, but there is no not your fault. But I don't know what is happening actually because. Perhaps okay. is the full is the full screen that is not. Sometimes it's, it's not the working. browser is the kind it's of the browser br you use. Yeah. Uh, okay. Alim, are you using Chrome or? I use Safari. I'll, uh, I'll use a different browser. Ah. Why don't Adriano speak first, and then I'll give a very short version of my talk. Yeah. Adriano. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, let's switch. Maybe to maybe Adriano. try Chrome and try to like uh, try to plot the whole screen, not only a window. Yeah, yeah, I'll do that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, anyway, Adriano, why don't you go first? I'm really sorry, everyone. Anyway, if you agree, we can skip to Adriano first, and yeah, yeah, then I'm happy with that. 
Okay, perfect. Yeah, that's okay for me. Okay, Adriano, please share your screen and I will introduce you. And okay. see myself, yeah. Yeah, you're, uh, I can see you. I cannot see your, uh, your presentation. Yeah, one second. Oh, yeah, uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, should be a uh, full screen or a window? Um, well, actually, I, I don't know. Let's try with full screen. Okay. Can you see it now? Uh, is loading. Okay. At least on mine. Yes, I can see your screen and I can see your pointer, which is more. okay. So, perfect. Uh, the next presentation is. The, the title of this presentation is The Vortex Driven Dance of Droplets Within Droplets, and uh, the presenter is Adriano Tiribocchi. So, Adriano, please uh, yes. begin whenever you want. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, thank you all for participating. And first of all, of course, I would like to thank the uh, organizers for the opportunity to speak at this uh, edition of the SFD. So shortly, I will, uh, um, this talk, I will speak a little bit about some work we have been doing in the last more or less couple of years with a list of authors you may see uh, below. Um, and this is about, uh, let's say, the understanding the uh, non-equilibrium physics of uh, multiple emulsions um, under um, the presence of external forcing such as shear flows or uh, poiseuille flows like um, uh, you can see, for example, in this configuration. In particular, the idea is to evaluate the effect of the um, uh, hydrodynamics in uh, selecting particular uh, novel non equilibrium steady states that I'll talk a little bit more uh, carefully later on. So, before going into the details, uh, I start with uh, a few quick definitions of what a multiple emulsion is. So, very generally, a multiple emulsion can be defined as a soft material um, in which there are smaller drops, uh, immiscible smaller drops, uh, dispersed within a larger one. Can you see my screen, right? I'm moving. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. Uh, so, the, um, let's say the simplest configuration is this one, in which you have, uh, for example, imagine the red region. Here is the water droplets uh, surrounded by a, a layer of oil, and uh, the whole system is immersed within, a, for example, a water um, fluid, and then you have a water or water uh, emar double immersion. You may also have more complex configurations, in which you have um, more layers, two layers, three layers, and so on. But, and um, the, the system we are more interested in in this talk is uh, the last one here in which you have uh, so-called multi-core emulsions. Typically, you have several droplets, immiscible droplets, because they are, um, there is a surfactant uh, absorbed onto the interface, which prevents you know, the coalescence of droplets, and they are dispersed within another phase, which can be, for example, oil, and the whole system is in turn uh, dispersed in uh, water, for example. In this case, you have more than one droplets, two, three, depending on the um, area fraction or volume fraction we are considering. So from, uh, let's say, an experimental point of view, uh, over the last more or less 20 years, there has been a growing interest in the creating and producing these uh, multiple emulsions. And in the first picture here on top, um, this is a typical um, a sort of a sketchy figure, in which a typical device is shown, device used for the production of this multiple emulsion. This is more or less a flow focuser. And the manufacturing of this uh, multiple emulsion works more or less in a two-step processes in which there is the emulsification of, for example, water droplets, imagine to these two inner fluids, then they are um, um, encapsulated in the middle fluid, which can be oil, and then there is a further emulsification step, which the, the final uh, emulsion, in which, for example, we have two core emulsions, is produced within the uh, outer channel. Of course, the experimental techniques have improved over the years, and uh, experimentalists have been capable to um, um, create, you know, more complex configurations in which you have, for example, um, multi-core emulsion with two droplets, four droplets, and so on, um, and, uh, you know, increasing the number of cores and increases also the volume fraction occupied by this, uh, um, this, this, uh, this course, uh, this, these systems. Uh, I like mentioning often this, uh, this nice work um, published by Guzovsky and Garstechkin, in which they have sort of created a connection between, uh, let's say, multiple emulsion and droplets, which are you can imagine a mesoscale object with the, uh, the um, sub nanoscale world of molecules. They have seen that if you pack um, a high volume fraction of emulsion within a spherical environment, which is not a droplet, there are some arrangement properties which are very similar or resemble very closely the properties of molecules. So they sort of created these mesoscale molecules uh, made by droplets, which is you know just a, an idea to give you a um, hint about possible you know, studies and applications coming from this object. On a more, um, let's say, um, material science side, 
applied. This objective found many uh, applications in uh, several sectors of modern industries mainly. It's about food science for the production of low calories food, in pharmaceutics, for example, for drug delivery. Typically, the drug is loaded within one of the cores and then it's released. And uh, apparently, the, the, the tick layer uh, provides a better control on the release time of the drug and also in other sectors such as cosmetics or for the building of soft porous materials more recently for the um, say construction of uh, um, uh, tissue-like uh, materials. So there are several possible applications in these systems. Um, uh, let's say that while that has been spent, has, has been spent you know, a lot of uh, efforts to um, understand from a theoretical and experimental point of view the, how this, uh, this, um, these emulsions are produced, uh, only more recently um, thanks to the um, improving of tools you know, available in many for simulations, uh, there have been um, a growing um, studies in um, trying to understand what's the role played by hydrodynamics in the system, and in particular in um, experiments or in simulations which are um, rather common. Imagine, for example, a situation like this, in which we have a double emulsion or a multi-core emulsion, which is confined within two walls, flat walls, which are at the top and at the bottom, and they move um, uh, the one, for example, with velocity v uh, rightwards, and the other one, velocity minus v leftwards. So this is a typical shear experiment, which there is a shear rate deforming, you know, the, the the whole system, and this is a typical structure of the. On, the, the, the flow field observed within the systems. So there are several questions one may ask, you know, uh, which are important also from the material science point of view. For example, what's the shape of these droplets? What's the stability of the system when um, and they went under deformation? And um, what's in particular the deformation of the outer of the outer droplets with respect to the inner ones, uh, which may, for example, affect the stability of imagine a, an emulsion-based uh, material, which which we have a lot of emulsions, and of course changing the the the, the structure and deforming just one drop it may also affect you know the stability and the structural integrity of the whole material and i may also uh, interesting you know investigating the role of hydrodynamic interaction for um, understanding whether there is a uh, room for uh, discovering new uh, non-equilibrium steady states uh, which is uh, the, um, precisely more or less the the, the the point of this talk if time permits if there are a few minutes in the end i will also uh, briefly show the, the results regarding you know the the um, effect of a Poiseuille flow in case of a, a multi-core emulsion. But most of the talk will be dedicated to the first example, so a multiple emulsion under a symmetric shear. So briefly, the physics uh, of the system. So uh, the, the physics, uh, the theoretical framework better is uh, rather well established, and it's based on uh, on equilibrium thermodynamics from the theoretical only theoretical point of view and simulations based on the lattice Boltzmann uh, techniques. So I'll quickly um, uh, mention this. Um, imagine of having, uh, um, for example, a two core uh, droplets like this, droplets one and two immersed within another fluid and then surrounded by a, another fluid. Uh, then you, for you know, for describing the properties of the system, you typically, in, at the mesoscale level, you use a set of hydrodynamic fields. Um, in this case, you have uh, a, a set of scalar order parameters phi um, in the same number of the number of droplets, so one, two, and three. Uh, they describe the concentration of the, of the fluid. Then you need a, a scalar, uh, sorry, a vector field, which is the fluid velocity, and the further scalar field, which is the density of the fluid in the limit of uncompressible fluid. Each of these fields is governed by a, um, an evolution equation, which are also rather well known. So the um, the concentration is governed by a convection diffusion equation, the first one. So we have uh, a number of, of the of equation which is the same as the number of uh, phases in the, in the system. In particular, you have here the, here the chemical potential that governs the uh, dynamic evolution of the system with the thermodynamic force. Then you have the velocity, the fluid, which is governed by the Navier-Stokes equation, and then the, uh, the continuity equation in the um, uncompressible limit. To completely solve this equation, you need an explicit expression of the chemical potential. Which, which stems from the uh, functional derivative of, the, of a free energy here. So you have to define a free energy, and this um, this is a sort of a generalization, more or less, free energy of a Landau, like Ginzburg Landau free energy, in which you have several terms. Um, Typically, the bulk terms uh, describing the, the, the bulk properties of the mixture, in which you have two minima, uh, phi zero and zero. Um, uh, this is uh, the, the double well potential displayed here. You know, we have the one minima, which is zero, one phase, and the other minima, which is phase zero, for example, the other phase. Then you have a further term, which is the interfacial terms, uh, so describing the, uh, the energetic cost due to the presence of the interfaces in systems that depends on the gradient of phi, which are these interfaces here. 
And then you have a final term, which is a repulsive term, um, capturing the, no, better uh, mimicking the effect of a sort of surfactant, uh, um, which prevents, you know, coalescence of droplets. If uh, epsilon is zero, of course, there is a droplet, you know, approaching um, closely, uh, would coalesce. Whereas if this, if this is non-zero, it is sufficiently high, there would be any um, merging. Now, this is the general theoretical framework. Uh, simulations are run by using the hybrid free energy lattice boson, which is a rather well-established method. So there are no, let's say, news about, I mean, the numerical method. Typically, you solve the Navier-Stokes equation with lattice Boltzmann and the other set of equations, the convection diffusions, uh, with the finite difference scheme. So rather well known in literature, this, this, um, this system. This uh, the simulations technique. So uh, let's see, um, let's go a little bit into de the details of the, um, of the, of the dynamic response, better of single and double emulsions. This is also rather well known in literature. The what was the response of these systems under shear? I'm just showing this as a you know as a reference to compare with what happens when you include more than one drop. And so, imagine for example of having I'm showing here a couple of movies. Imagine of having, for example, an isolated droplet or a uh, or a double emulsion. You see that under shear, this attains more or less a steady state, which is an elliptical shape. Five minutes, Adrian. Okay, yes. And uh, this is the steady state, whereas when, when uh, um, you have um, a, a core included within in, uh, in the emulsion. So uh, basically, um, what you see is that um, uh, the deformation of the outer droplets is generally larger than the formation of the cores, which the outer droplet acts as sort of a shield, you know, preventing um, um, in, in intense deformation of the smaller one, of course, as long as the shear rate is uh, is low enough to avoid you know, droplet breakup, and um, and you can see here, I don't know whether you can see uh, clearly, this is the plot of the deformation parameter. Uh, in, depending on the major semi-axis and minor semi-axis, uh, of course, as long as the, the, the shape is an ellipse, uh, which is generally higher for larger droplets compared to the smaller ones. So these are generally uh, rather well-known results in, um, in, a, in a single emulsion, in, dub, in, in double emulsions, when you know, um, they are under a symmetric shear. What happens when you uh, switch on, when you, sorry, switch on the, 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 the field, the, the shear, when you include more than, um, more than one core. So this is interesting because in this case you have this sort of dancing. So once the shear is imposed, so the, the, the upper and the lower um, um, walls are moving in the opposite direction, the internal cores start to develop this uh, rotating um, periodic motion, resembling more or less what we call planetary-like motion, which they in this case are rotating clockwise. Uh, and the motion is triggered by the shear structure of the vortex field. Um, I'm stopping the movie otherwise, uh, so to discuss a little bit better. So the, there are two differences with respect to the previous case. Besides, you know, this steady state in which we have this uh, periodic planetary-like motion, we also observe that the, the structure of the vortex is, say, more stretched, and there are also small recirculation fluids uh, occurring within the vortex, which are due to the coupling between the flow field and the interfaces. You, of course, can imagine that if the number of droplets of the area fractions um, uh, the internal droplets increases, this, uh, this periodic motion would, would lost and would be lost, and then you would have sort of pre-chaotic motions because of the, let's say, complex coupling between velocity field and uh, interfaces. So this, this sort of periodic behavior is observed as long as the number of droplets of volume fraction is low, let's say, enough. So when, say, the area fraction is around this lower than 0 0.3. Interestingly, if you plot the deformation parameter, you see that for the same values of the shear rate, when you increase the number of cores, there, is the, there are these oscillations developing. These are due to the, of course, long range dynamic interactions and collisions of the droplets with the external interface. This is the uh, D uh, parameter for the external droplets. Typically, what would you observe is a sort of a continuous elongation and uh, retraction of the external uh, interface due to the repeated collision of the internal cores. So this is an interesting result, you know, we have published, um, which is, was apparently unobserved so far about, you know, this uh, sort of dancing uh, of uh, the internal course uh, triggered by the, uh, the, the vorticity, mainly in, the, um, in, uh, in, in multiple emotions. So I think I have a few minutes to quickly discuss what happens when you, um, uh, when you impose a quasi L flow in a, in, a, in, a, in a multiple emulsion. So at the top figure, we have also um, a rather well established you know, results. So this is the typical uh, equilibrium configuration of a drop, an isolated droplet. And this is the, another typical steady state shape of the, of the droplet under quasi L flow. This is called baltet like shape. 
the shape of course depends on the flow field so this is one of the possible shapes these red arrows indicate the flow field in the frame of reference uh, lab frame of reference whereas this um, in this picture here c you have the um, fluid velocity in the frame of reference of the droplets and uh, the idea was to see okay we have vortexes here as well so why not trying to understand what happens when you include more cores and to see whether you can observe also a periodic motions in the systems and the answer is that even in this case uh, for example if you look at this at the movie below you see that under Poiseuille, under Poiseuille flow of course there is uh, the usual deformation with the external droplets the two cores initially accumulate at the leading edge of the droplet and then they there is an asymmetry developing in which the two cores um, uh, move in the upper part of the droplet and start to sort of rotate continuously and, uh, and typically one droplet chases the other one and uh, um, and this is sort of a, we call this dancing of, of internal course triggered by the again by the vortex structure of the field and of course this can occur either um, in the upper part of the um, drop it or in the lower part depending on the um, mainly on the on the on the asymmetry where it develops and on the the, the values of the, the difference of pressure in the in the in the system uh, on a more general basis we have also seen that uh, this can be this, this picture can be also generalized to more droplets and for example here when you include two cores you have either the state i've discussed it just before or another state in which the two droplets the two cores uh, just move in the upper and lower region of the of the emulsion just they get stuck there and these are long-lived state. This LL stands for long-lived. This is because you know they uh, you can observe these at very late times. A rather similar behavior is when you have three cores. So you may have a state in which there are two cores um, in the lower region and one in the upper region, or three cores just rotating in the upper region. Whereas if you increase the number of cores, you observe some crossing, sort of level crossing from one state to the other one due to the complex coupling of the flow field with the interface. Here you have a, a picture of the flow field within uh, the cores, and you see that the, the, the flow field here pushes the droplet number three in the lower regions, and then you see here the transition, if you plot you know, the display of the center of mass and this this droplets in a, um, get in a, its cup is coupled with the, with the droplet number four and then they start to rotate in a similar way in which droplet one and two um, do uh, does in the in the upper part of the of the emulsion and to characterize you know these states we have used this sort of a, a bracket formulation which apparently can be used somehow to capture you know, different state observed either long-lived state or short-lived short-lived because um simply you would observe many crossings of droplets from the upper part to the lower part so these are not any more long-lived and steady state so a uh, very quick conclusion we have seen that uh, in multiple emulsion there are new non-equilibrium steady states mainly triggered by vorticity if the uh, if generally if the um, the, low, the, the, the volume fraction, the number of courses is very low, you may observe this uh, periodic motion, whereas if the volume fraction is very high, even under Poisson flow, you observe this sort of pre-chaotic motion depending on the um, uh, multiple multi-body collisions of droplets and aerodynamic interactions. I think I can stop here. I'm surely of time. So thank you all for the okay. for your attention. Okay, thank you so much, Adriano, for your presentation. We have time for one quick question. Then I will skip to Kuzumat Maya, uh, to Alim. So, someone have a question? Okay, if this is not the case, I will skip to Alim. Uh, and in order to allow him to uh, finish his presentation. So Alim, are you here? So thank you so much, Adriano, another time. Okay. So I hope uh, uh, you can now, see it. Now I can see your screen. Yeah. And I can okay. see also your pointer moving. So please go. Okay, okay. great. So I'm going to give a very uh, a brief version. So I'm really sorry for the uh, for yeah, the, the problem earlier. So um, what I would like to do is to actually look at problems to do with liquid infused surfaces. So I'm just going to show two movies uh, inspired uh, what's inspiring liquid into surfaces which are this uh, picture plants uh, this is a movie when uh, the plant is uh, dry and this is the one when it's wet so when you have the case where uh, the plant is wet you actually get a surface which is very slippery so in the context of uh, biomimicry uh, what you should be thinking is therefore a surface which is rough or porous and this is being imbibed by a lubricant so typically an oil 
and then we're interested in the dynamics of a droplet which is sitting on top of this uh, effective substrate. So one problem that I would like to talk to you today is what happens if the texture has a gradient. So you see that this is uh, less uh, solid fraction here and then uh, basically uh, larger solid fraction on the right. And I want to know what sort of motion that you can get out of it. Uh, so in particular, what is interesting is that people have looked at wetting gradients, uh, but they always move in one specific direction. So uh, what is interesting with liquid infused surfaces is that it turns out you can actually have bi-directional motion. And to understand this, this is what I was trying to uh, explain earlier, uh, we can actually look at the uh, forces that actually act um, at the surface, uh, basically con at the contact line. So we can look at uh, contributions coming from the uh, water and the effective substrate, the oil and the effective substrate, and the air and the effective substrate. And this is probably the key message I would like you to, uh, to get. So um, in the end, we can come up with a driving force that has a form that looks like this, where all the complication because of the corrugation is captured in this integral. Uh, and there is a prefactor that you can interpret by what is the prefer preferential wetting between uh, the droplet on the uh, solid and then the droplet on the uh, basically the lubricant uh, surface. So if this term is positive, you're going to have a droplet which is moving to the denser solid area. Whereas if this term is negative, you're going to have a case where a droplet is moving to the sparser solid area. And um, the simulation that we have done is using a uh, free, en uh, free energy ternary uh, lattice Boltzmann method that our group has developed over the past couple of years. So similar to what Adriano was talking about, we have this double well potential. And because we have three fluids, we have three of such terms. And we use the square gradient um, to actually uh, mimic the surface tension. So we've benchmarked this carefully. We can capture the, uh, the Neumann triangle, so the different surface tensions in the, in, the, in the problem. And this is important because we have to capture this uh, contact line uh, properly. And then to uh, capture the wetting interactions between the different fluids and the surfaces, we add a free energy term that looks like this. So this is the simplest one you can do, which is a linear term. And again, we have benchmark it, and then we can capture a good contact angle, uh, typically anything between 20 to 150, 160 degrees. Okay, so uh, this is important because we want to capture these two contact lines uh, properly. So, in comparison to other problems in wetting where you only have one contact line, uh, the difficulty with liquid infused surfaces is that you have to capture the motion of three contact lines uh, correctly. So that's basically the, uh, the, the, the main computational challenge. So we do this uh, with uh, a free energy model. Uh, so uh, what we typically do is that we uh, solve at the uh, continuum level, the continuity and the Navier-Stokes equation. And because we have three different fluids, uh, we have to at least uh, introduce two kahn hilliard equations uh, corresponding to basically the interfaces between one and two, one and three, if you like. Okay, so that's uh, in brief uh, the method that we do. So let me just show you the results uh, very quickly. Uh, so remember that I tell you that uh, this is the important uh, term, the important prefactor that tells you the direction of motion. So what you see in this phase diagram, uh, on the y-axis, this is basically uh, the wettability of the droplet on the solid. And on the x-axis, this is the wettability of the droplet on the uh, lubricant uh, fluid. And then what we have done is that we have carried out a lot of simulations and also experiments. And then if you are in this blue region over here, our prediction is that you're going to move to the denser solid area. So this is the typical simulation that you can do. Uh, and when we can realize this using an experiment, uh, for example, if you have a water droplet on a surface which is imbibed by deodomethane, uh, whereas if you are, let's say, somewhere here in the red region, we can actually show that the droplet is going to move to the sparser solid area. And we can use exactly the same uh, solid, but we imbibe it with, let's say, FC70. So it's a different oil. And it moves in the opposite direction. OK? And then we have carried out a, a wide range of surface, a wide range of uh, fluids for the uh, droplets and the lubricant. And then the basic picture is robust. Um, but of course, depending on the corrugation that you use, uh, there would be uh, some differences in terms of motion. Um, so for example, if I just focus on these uh, two guys over here, just to uh, save time, uh, there's always a competition between um, 
how fast you want the droplet to move and how far you can actually move the droplet. So if you use a step gradient uh, like this, you typically get uh, dynamics, which is represented in the red line where you have fast droplet motion, but you can only move it uh, by a little bit. Whereas if you use a smooth gradient, like a number four here, you're going to have a motion which is quite slow. So this is represented uh, by the uh, green line here. Uh, the, the velocity is slow, but you can actually move it a long way. So typically, you know, end to end in our simulation box. Um, and then the last couple of slides I want to tell you is that, well, what can you use this for? Uh, so this is uh, quite interesting uh, for application if you want to, dro to do a droplet sorting and binning. So based on the phase diagram, depending on the properties of the droplets, you can sort it moving left or right. But actually, we can be a bit more creative. Uh, for example, if we combine this with gravity, because of the balance uh, between uh, gravitational force and the surface tension force will be different depending on the size, you can actually make the droplet move in different directions. Uh, this is, in a sense, the continuous uh, version. We can also make the uh, surface corrugations in discrete patterns. And in this way, you can actually bend them uh, within a certain range. Um, and of course, uh, this could be uh, interesting for microfluidics application because not only you can now sort droplets based on size, but you can also sort them based on wetting properties or interfacial properties. So I think I'm going to uh, finish there. Uh, once again, I apologize for uh, all the technical problems. Uh, if you have questions, I'm happy to take them. So again, I'm very sorry. I have to uh, go very fast because I don't want to uh, interfere with the uh, plenary talk. Thank you. OK, thank you so much, Alim. Um, if someone has some question to, to post to Alim, please. I think we have one minute to, for, for a question. OK, if not, I thank you again, Alim, and all the other presenters. Uh, I think we have uh, now the break the, for the lunch, and then we have a plenary after the break. So. Thanks again to everyone, uh, to the presenters and to the audience, and see you later.